everybody. Welcome in. It is time. Yes, it is time for the 215th episode of Three Guys Before the Game. And oh, we got a dandy for you. I mean, we got a dandy for you. Three Guys Before the Game with our very special guest, Coach John Beeline. And it's brought to us by Burdett Camping Center, the only warranty forever RV dealer in all of West Virginia. Visit them at Burdett Camping dot com and i'll tell you what i spoke with my guy over at burdette camping last week thank you all very much for listening that's all i got to say is thank you very much the three guys special is out off the line they had it it was unbelievable it was the it was the tiffin the van lee beacon by tiffin model 42 rdb they had that special center you sure that? three guys special three Walk guys on special say you'd like the three guys there special. was 141 they dropped the thing off 24 large you got it down to 17 gentleman came in said i'm a three guys listener i want to take a look at it and drove it off the lot so you'll see it it's out and about blue lot football this season he's here huge mountaineer fan we tried to tell you it's a nice deal Meanwhile, they've got other vehicles. You name the land, and they've got it. It's uh, BurdetteCamping.com, located in Winfield, the only warranty forever RV dealer in all of West Virginia. So here's the deal on today's show. As I said earlier, 215 episodes. For 214 before this one, for 214, we've asked his people. uh, We've pleaded with his people. Can we get them on? Can we get them on? Finally, the 215th ask, they said, Okay, he'll come on. <laughs> Not sure. I just made that up. Please welcome to the show, <laughs> Coach John Beeline. Coach, good. Yeah, I, that sounded dramatic, didn't it? Like 214 times every week we've asked the guy to come on, and they said no, not yet. And then finally he it, said it, yes. It's because I don't have any people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it now it's just me. And I and I would. Oh man, I love saying yes to you guys. Uh, how are so, you, man? Uh, it's great. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Trying to uh, just to acclimate myself to a whole different lifestyle right now. And I some days I love it, and some days I I need to be busier. Uh, but it is a, it's great. It's great. And it's great to talk with you guys because we have so many friends back in West Virginia. It's it's wonderful. That's awesome, man. We appreciate it. We're going to jump around like I uh, like I said to you. And you so you mentioned something interesting right off the bat there and that is some days you're good, some days you know, you're kind of like, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You have always been that what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I mean, you were like energizer bunny guy. And so I do you do you ever have that day where you just go like I need to be in a gym I need to be I need to be showing someone pivot step pass to the outside <laughs> hand do you have do you, have you have that feeling I think I'm okay with that one I'm still uh, Kathleen calls me checklist Charlie you know <laughs> that I have that list of I got to go through every day and try to get things off uh, but I do uh, I, I don't I, I think that will come more once we get into September. You know, yeah. um, because I even miss the recruiting, some of the travel, the recruiting, the evaluating kids in the summer. Of course, nobody's doing it now. But uh, even that was part of the man. That was part of the chase. That was part of the thing that to just get the right kid. And it wasn't about, oh, we got to beat somebody to get somebody. No, we just got to find the right guy and it will all work out. We just got to find the right guys. And that that was so important. And uh, that hunt you know, is over for right now and could be forever. But it was, that was, that's what I really focused on in the summer. So that's interesting. So you had not lost that interest in doing that aspect of it because when guys had been in the business for a long time, normally, as you know, the first thing that they don't like anymore is spending their summers out looking for kids. You had yeah. not got that. No, no, because I knew that was the, that was the best way to impact the program. And I don't mean Oh, we got to get a top 50 guy. We got to get a top 100 guy. No, we got to, it was that hunt to get the right people that fit West Virginia, fit Michigan, Richmond, really just, they were, they're, they're basically the same type of, of young men. And just because that is, is, uh, that's what makes you happy is coaching the right kids. That, let's, and so that, that that was so important for us. Let's stay there for a minute, Coach. we got a lot of areas to get into, but that that's an area that fascinates me about you. I think you're one of the best to ever do it, if not the best to do it, in terms of recruiting chemistry. 
bringing a guy in, and he may be very talented, but if you didn't feel he fit within that locker room and your guys, you took a pass on him. So when did that become the philosophy that chemistry and fit was so ultra important to you? Yeah, I think it started at the very beginning when I when I was a high school coach. I think I walked into a great situation at New Fane High School where it was just, you know, I had great kids already waiting there. But when I, I had to build my first program in Erie Community College, it was easy. We, we had some talented teams, and then we had some teams, and the teams had that chemistry. So from then on, whether any of the other stops that we had, it was about getting the right fit. Um, you know, culture wins. Culture wins so often, and I'm not the first guy to say that, but I, I saw it firsthand. And you're still going to make mistakes because, uh, you know, the, someone will not be as talented as you hoped or might not be the culture that he you it, that he pr- was perceived to have. Uh, but most of the time, if you prioritize getting that people, Rudy Tomjanovich said this to me in Michigan, it was right online, he says, you don't amass talent, you build a team. And it is so true. You're building a team. And you just think of some of the guys that we had at West Virginia, you know, where J.D. Collins taking a Greyhound bus from Houston to Morgantown to start his career there. Uh, it's incredible. And what and he started every game for four years. <laughs> I mean, it's just incredible what a great impact J.D. had on that. He wanted it so badly he was willing to do anything. One and you all- just find these guys. You find these guys. And they make everybody else better. One of the all-time underrated guys, right, Coach? So oh. quiet, but just a wonderful, a wonderful kid. Which leads you into that same question: If you're going to rely on chemistry and fit and how guys get along, you were depending a lot on the current team to help evaluate recruits as well. I would assume, right? Yeah, yeah, that was always important that we we tried to get the right guys, and it, there would we were always in contact the best that we could with with say, what, okay, what do you think? What do you think? Or we get, you know, we get referrals from other, from, from ex players or whatever. We just said we just don't want. It's not. This is talent is certainly important, but we we always thought that a, you know, a three star guy became a four star guy if he had, you know, a, a great attitude and was going to be a great teammate. A four star guy became a five star guy if he had was a great teammate. I mean, you look at. You got to look at a guy like Darius Nichols. What a what an incredible young man, and who was probably a four star recruit. But he was he had a five star career uh, at at West Virginia, and and so we had so many people like that. Um, that over time, you know, they, they, they what what their their beliefs and their attitude made our teams click. I want I don't want to belabor this, but I find it incredibly interesting be, uh, on this point. It takes coaches so long, it seems to me a lot of times, that they don't buy the shiny squirrel, which is accumulation of talent over team chemistry. But it looks as though you caught that like really, really early, which I think is atypical for a coach. Um, Did you have an epiphany or did you have a bad experience where there was a talented team that didn't like each other or was that, how did that get ingrained in you so quickly? Well, I can't tell you. I don't think I have an answer for that. And usually I have an answer. For, I try to have an answer for some things. But <laughs> but I'm looking at it, your it, records it, here. You you never struggled. Yeah. I mean, Erie County no, Community no. College, you won 20, you won 17, you won 21, you won 17, you won 63% of your games. You went 75 and 43 in four seasons. And that was when you you were just sticking your feet into it. So you didn't have, yeah. like, I think a lot of times a coach has yeah. to have an 8 and 20 before they can go like, ah, this ain't going to work. Yeah. I think, you know, because – I was I was I'm a nomad I was a nomadic coach for a long time. You move spot to spot, so you're rebuilding. You know whether it was right or wrong, because a lot of times I I took a job over the coach before me got fired, and and the team was just ready to win at that time. But it, it you know I think when you're rebuilding programs, um, you see it from the very beginning, and if you do it again, then you do it again. You get you get to learn from the mistakes. And that's what we tried to do all the time was my assistants and I, where we, and I had some, I didn't have some good ones. I had some great ones. Uh, I think 10, I think it's a total of 10 that went on to become division one head coaches over this whole period of either players or coaches. And uh, they, uh, they would, we'd all sort of sift through it. But I think when you're rebuilding a program, you know, 
what do we need first? We need guys, you know, we have to have talent, but you also have guys that know that, you know, how to win. And sometimes talented guys, as good as they are, don't that get that winning part. That winning part might get left along the way for, uh, and they might be looking at how they're rated rather than did their team win the championship. Mm -hmm. And that's not their fault. That's just the way it goes sometimes. And we were, you know, we did a lot. We've done a lot for years of watching a guy go over to his huddle, where he sits. It when he, it seems way ahead, way behind. He's on the bench. Is he cheering for people? Those were big things. Talk to everybody: the guidance counselor, the two coaches, the assistant coaches. Try and find out: is this kid, you know, is he a fit? Doesn't mean if he's not a fit, doesn't mean he's a bad kid. It means we were just looking for one thing over and over again. And yeah. for the most part, it worked pretty well. Yeah. I remember when you when you came here, you would videotape your huddles during games yeah. and then watch the kids' body language yeah. in yeah. the huddle to see who was locked in, who was out wandering yeah. around. We we would keep the the on the whole huddle would keep the uh, camera on it most of the time just to see who was waving waving up in the stands <laughs> or, or whatever. But but it was it was really important for us to just. You know, to coach the whole thing. You know, the timeout is really, really important, and and coach the whole thing, but also emphasize. Listen, pro scouts are watching you, and we didn't invent this. Pro scouts are watching you in the huddle too, and and what are you going to do there? And the same thing, high school, high schools, colleges are watching you. We we mention to them all the time. You know, so um, there's there are a bunch of small things, and Tony, you just learn from mistakes. Yeah. And you, you say, boy, I, I don't want to make that a mistake again. And I never was an assistant coach, so I didn't say, didn't have that thing, well, I would have done this. No, we lost games because we made mistakes as coaches. Yeah. And as a result, you say, well, I don't want that to happen again. And so you make quick adjustments. If you were to, you coached 164 games at West Virginia, five total seasons, Two NCAA tournaments, of course, the Elite Eight, Sweet 16, NIT Championship, second round of the NIT in your second season at WVU. If I were to say, give me a word or two words to describe your five years at West Virginia, yeah. what comes to mind? Uh, I used it before because I think most fairy tales have good endings, and it, it was. It was a wonderful five years of, a, of really a storybook. It would be, be better, a storybook with a very good ending to it of just of, uh, and, and I was extremely proud when the team that won the NIT championship with all those young kids went on to the final four. Mm -hmm. And I think they made, I think they might've made, made a sweet 16 and Bobby did a great job with them. So, um, I, you know, you went into it to accomplish some things and, and it, it happened and, you know, uh, Michigan was a special place and we decided to make that one last move. Um, and, uh, but we, the, the, it did not diminish of what a tremendous time we had and, and, and what, uh, just the, 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 the experience that my family and I had in West Virginia, you just, you, you can't, you, you, you can't replicate that. It was, it was fabulous. Let's go back coach. Let's dive into that a little bit. Let's talk about your time here and let's start from when you arrived. You came at such a tumultuous time in the program's history. Coach Catlett had retired. Dan Dockich was here but left after a week and here you come into that situation. Start with that and walk us through. You walk in to that situation. You did your press conference. You go into the office for the first day of work and you said to yourself, what? <laughs> I think we had some we had some huge issues right away to deal with. I mean, when you think about that, those years there was uh, they had what were they one in fifteen I think in the Big East that year yeah, eight and twenty uh, overall eight and twenty overall yeah, yeah yeah and it got off to a good start, but we had a lot of issues because you had you know Gal did not coach the whole season and and then Gal had resigned and so anytime that and now now you have. Uh, I think there was a major play for Coach Huggins to come the first time, and then Dan. And there was basically the the poor guys; they had very little leadership during that time because there was no leader. Gal had gone, and I, I, so if you take the whole coaching search, there was two or three months, and uh, it, it was very it was a bit chaotic to say the bit, the least. And we just got through it. I still mean I still remember I was out on a um, I think Ed Pastelong wanted me to go way down south. 
and and down south and do a, a booster event, which was great. You, and Jeff Neubauer called me, my assistant, and said, "Coach, you got to get back here. It's <laughs> it's not good. We we got guys not you know we 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 had to make some big changes in our culture right away. And I think I canceled the next event and got back and to make sure that here we are in April, late April, exams are coming." And we're not going to have a team at all if if we don't get everybody together because the, the the young men were lost. They, they there was all of a sudden there was there, there was there wasn't any leadership. We had to provide that first. We had to we had to do that first before we could go on to even recruiting or even you know things that the the university obviously needed me to do too. Your first roster at West Virginia, two thousand two two thousand three season. Ready, Chaz Briggs. Patty Beeline, Tyrone Sally, J.D. Collins, Nick Patella, Duriel Juice Price, Drew Shafino, Josh Yeager, Johannes Herbear, Jonathan Curran, Kevin Pitznagel. That was group number one. Your, your, very, first, your very first game, uh, Delaware State. Fa- va- vague memories of it or not? Because I would imagine the first time you go into a game with a team for the first time, you got no idea, right? I mean, you got no clue no, whatsoever no, as to what no, you're no. – and you, uh, by the way, victorious, 59-46. It was like a low-scoring game, like yep. 52-42 yeah. or something. 59-46. Oh, yeah. no, give yourself some credit. 59-46. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then at Duquesne. And then you actually, you well, you see, no, I didn't even remember this. So you got rolling early. Oh, yeah, well, I remember look, this. Look, yeah, you remember the big one I remember there, the big one. Game four, like this is what people went like, whoa, what up? It's game four. That was a great game, Coach, in Charleston against Florida. Brett Nelson, yeah. 68-66. That was a hair bear with a step back. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm yelling. I'm yelling, no. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't made that shot. He, he hadn't tried that shot in game or practice yet. And all of a sudden, the game's on the line. And I'm, I'm saying, no. And, boom, <laughs> and then I'm going, that's my guy. Way to go, Joe. That's my guy. <laughs> So the the mere fact, like I said, so some of these guys. So Patrick was supposed to play for you at Richmond. JD is you. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. JD yep. was JD came in on a bus. Um, Joe Hairbear was going to play for you at Richmond, right? That was that well, was. We were, the, he was going to come visit, right? The weekend that I took the job at West Virginia, he was he had a plane ticket to come over, but we changed. I said, Joe, why don't we delay that plane ticket for a couple of weeks? Cause I'm changing jobs. And, uh, so that was, that really worked out well. That really worked out well, yeah. really well. He started every game too. Yeah. To say the least, it worked out well. How, so be honest now, talent wise, how bad was that first team you had? Oh, I think they had great potential because they were so young. You know, we had, we had, well, and then we had Dior Fisher. It came at that same time. Yeah. And, and I, I think it was called the five and eight rule where they absolved it for one year. What it, the rule was, you couldn't take more than five in a year or more than eight over two years. Yeah. And I think we were caught in that. And all of a sudden they said, okay, we start over then. You can take five. So that allowed us to take Joe, JD, Kevin, put Dior on scholarship. And I'm forgetting one maybe. I, I, I did, Because Patrick wasn't on scholarship until the next year. So some, it allowed us to take enough people uh, to do it and that we were blessed we were really blessed but he, hey there's three guys on that team that no one will ever remember as being great players but uh, Jonathan Curran Nick Patella and the late Ju- Juice Price yeah. Duriel Price they were keys on that team that's what we're talking about they were culture makers like a Ted Talkington would have been later on they were guys that just hey their, their scout team would beat the first team all the time because of Nick yeah, Jonathan Juice, they were all good and let us, and, but they weren't in the coach's office every day telling you they should be playing ahead of Joe Airbear. You know, they, they, they really wanted the team to be good. And those are the things we're talking about. So we had a talent on that team for growing. That was our talent. Yeah. And Chaz Briggs, Chaz Briggs didn't start because Kevin Pissnagel and Tyrone, Tyrone Sally and Drew Shafino, right? He didn't start, and there Chaz, a pretty good player. Chaz and I stay in touch to this day. He came to a Hall of Fame type of thing I was inducted in, and I, he walked in the door, and I said, that guy looks just like Chaz Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? How and about he that? walks up and sits at my table. 
and I didn't know he's him and Tyrone came in together. So great, great people. And uh, they, he wants to be a coach. So it's really cool. But good kid. Really good kid. See, it's amazing that there's always those stories. When you when you get a program that turns, you go back and look at the beginning, and there's always those glue guys that keep it together. But yeah. you, you mentioned Pitt Snuggles. See, that's a fascinating story to me, too. Because think about the, the arc of Kevin's career probably changed significantly with you coming in. You talk about a big guy that wanted to be on the perimeter yeah. and shoot threes. That doesn't fit in everybody's system back in yeah. 03, but that was right in your wheelhouse. That was a yeah. perfect fit for you, even though yeah. he wasn't a guy you recruited. Yeah, you know, he wasn't um, – he didn't play above the rim, and he, he would admit that, And uh, but he was a guy that we had just – I started playing small. Our team started playing small back at Lemoyne way back. And like I said, these are mistakes that you make – that turned to be it's like you get pruned and, and you grow back stronger and so i had tried to play with four men in the past that that were like five men but oh i'm gonna play two big guys and like ewing and charles oakley the game was changing quick and i'd already i'd already made that change and we said let's i know he's 610 i know he's not a low post guy but let's spread the floor we don't have much other choice right now let's spread the floor and and use him as a five let tyrone sally who's a three have him play the four uh drew shavino who's a two have him play the three air bear get in the backcourt and in jd and all of a sudden that i mean i thought that team was what were they 15 and 16 tony i, 14, I forget they, 14 and 15 14 and yep. 15 and we had wins over tennessee yep. and florida. and uh florida and a couple good wins in the league too i think we had over Beat Vill- somebody in you the beat Villanova. Seton Hall or some. You beat Villanova. Beat Villanova. At Villanova. Yep. At Villanova. Yep. Uh, so we had some we had some good wins in that season, and and that was just a good sign of things to come, really, because Dior was Dior Fisher was waiting, and Mike Ganzi came in the next year. It's fascinating when you think back about. It. I don't know about you. It does not seem to me that's seventeen doggone years. Shocking. That does not seem like seventeen years. I don't know. What do you feel? Does that feel? What's it feel like to you if you were to nah, say how many it, years ago? No, nah, it it does seem like it's. Well, how could that have been so long ago? Yeah. Uh, it it's just couldn't. Uh, it's it, it's it's too long, and you know I've tried to stay in touch with as many of the guys as possible, but those uh, those those the memories. You know, I got a chance to a lot of time to ch- spend with Mike Ganzi w- with the Cavaliers this year. And obviously I p- see Patrick and uh, Dior Fisher and I have been talking a lot lately and trying to help him as he transitioned into the the, uh, the working environment. He wants to coach. Yeah. So uh, it just what goes by so fast. And I look forward. I think now that I have time, I, I want to reconnect with every one of them that I that, – Maybe they don't want to reconnect with me, but I'd like to reconnect with all of them. That's that would be great. Well, it's pretty wild when you think about that. And for as long as you've, you've done it, uh, the, when, when the Chaz Briggses and the Dior Fishers and and those guys still maintain contact, then take that and exponentially multiply that from how many guys you've coached through the years. I mean, that's that'll keep you busy for forever. Uh, just keeping, oh, yeah. in, get, keeping in touch with these guys. Well, I try what I tried to do, and I I I just. Is my, I, I lost some contacts, but during the, the the whole Black Lives Matter movement four weeks ago, I tried to reach out to a bunch of the guys to just tell them how much I cared and how much they should continue to really speak their mind and and and, and insist on on racial justice everywhere. And so I was able to reconnect with some people, and that was good uh, because they need a coach. You're not the, just their coach for four years. You want to be their coach and their your mentor uh, their whole life. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was good. I, I got to reach out to, to Tyler Marone and Frank and Darius and so many players. It was really good. That's good. Um, second season starts. And I remember this, again, like it was yesterday, all of the anticipation that Dior would be making on this team. And so there was excitement there. But – you guys, the classic coaching staff of undervalue and over deliver. 
you guys had talked us into, myself included, that James that James Madison season opening game, like you were going to play the 72 Lakers. It was going to be the 72 Lakers. We we went into Harrisonburg. We didn't know. A, oh, I don't know. What do you know? Do you remember that? I remember that because I remember yelling at Newbauer because he was trying to spin me in the hallway. Like, I don't know. I'm, what are you talking about? You it's James, James Madison. Madison. And they go, I don't know. I'm yeah. just telling you. We got to go down there. We got to go down there. So, oh, you guys are too much. So you no, we we you, always those, those games. I first of all, for us to go there is crazy. But I think it was a two for one deal. Yeah, I think we were at the end of it, at the two for one. But yeah, and Bill Lilly, who is one of the one of the finest young men I've ever, I've ever had assist me. I'm on the bus, and and the the minutes before those games, the hours before the game, you guys remember. I'm not like. I'm not a good guy to be around. I, I got everything that could. The Irish, the Irish mother right now is that everything that could go wrong is going to go wrong in this game. So I'm in like the second seat, and Sherman Diller is coaching James Madison. I'm getting off the bus, and Bill Lilly said to me, "You know, Sherman Dillard always he always got these boxing ones and triangle twos he plays sometimes." I wanted to kill him at that time. I just wanted to. I wanted to grab him. He just added to it, and we went out, and uh, we really played well. I got in trouble that game, you know, guys. I got in trouble. I don't know if you could get the box score. But I'm, I'm Patrick, looking at the box score right now. How many minutes did Patrick play? Patrick played. Let me see what we got down for me. Patrick got a solid 10, ten. minutes in. He ten. got 10 and minutes. How many, points did he, how many points did he score? Point a minute. Ten, ten points, 10 minutes. Yeah, and, and so when I get we get the win, I'm all excited about the win. Right. But he hadn't hit a jump shot the last week in practice. And I, I get that feel, you know, and I put him in the, I, I put him in the game and he, in 10 minutes. Like I said, he would have scored 40 if he would have played 40 minutes, you know? Yeah. And, and I get on the phone and I call Kathleen and I'm all excited and I can't get her. She's on the phone. She's talking to Pat in the back of the bus and neither one of them are very happy with me at that time. <laughs> Yeah, you. I mean, not maybe not your best personnel move. He was three for three from the field, two of two from three, two of two at the foul line, two assists, zero turnovers in ten minutes. Yeah, he's got to get some run. Pretty clean line. Right <laughs> he's got to get some run. Uh, yeah, I was. I got home, and I think Kathleen had the couch made up for me. You're sleeping on the couch when you get home. So here, oh man, but th those are great, great days. So, 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 uh, Dior plays his <laughs> Dior plays his first game as good as ever. Times he gets he goes fourteen six and eight blocks, and I think we oh came God. we came out of that game and we were going like, okay, we're high stepping, and then you don't want to talk about this, but we'll talk about it anyway. Ronnie Everhart's greatest claim to fame. He comes in with his Northeastern team, and, oh, yeah. and Berea. I bet you have nightmares oh. still of Berea. I talked about him the other day. I talked about <laughs> the other day. I, I saw. I, I was talking to a gal who is of Puerto Rican descent, and she's coaching basketball. And I said, JJ Berea came up and put one on us one time, <laughs> and, and Frank Martin. Tra they tra he had Ronnie trapping. It, trapping every we had never seen anything like it. He just took us out of our stuff, and JJ was incredible. Nobody had ever heard of him. Yeah, I think Frank had five transfers from one junior college come to Northeastern, so they it wasn't like they were getting used to each other. They had already played together for for a couple of years. Yeah. that was bad. It was like thanks. It ruined Thanksgiving. I think it really <laughs> killed Thanksgiving. They come I, in. Yeah, I, I believe it was. Written. They won 91-84. Oh. He had he had ten or he had nineteen points, but he had ten assists, one turnover. Yeah. They had another kid I didn't remember. Marcus Barnes had thirty one. Mm. So anyway, yeah. anyway, oh, they were a ta talented team. Ronnie did a great job. So can you tell in season two that the pieces are starting to come together? When did you have a feel that mm, okay, we're, I know. Two, two games into your second season isn't going to be the indicator, but when did you have a good feel that, hey, things are going to be all right here at West Virginia? Well, well, any time that you lose a guarantee game, you you hand a check and lose. That I'm, I, there, There's like uh, maybe four or five times in my life we've lost guarantee games, and I think each one almost kills me. So that it did not start off well. Things were things were a little shaky there because we didn't seem that now you got infusion of new talent, you know, Frank Young, Tyler Ralph, Jarrah Young, Brad Byerson, right? You got Dior into that group, and you really only lose Chaz Briggs out of the group before. 
So you always go through this assimilation process of, all right, who's playing, who's getting shots, a bigger reality take out. Yeah, we got 10 guys now, but 10 good, if, if 10 guys all think they're the good guys, <laughs> that's hard. And they should, they should think they're good. So you have to sort of keep going through it. So uh, that was a very uncomfortable year because we were, we, we thought we'd make that next step and we weren't tracking that way. And uh, we had to make, I think we had to make some big personnel changes. And, and I didn't think that whole second year that, you know, we were making progress fast enough, but we won the games we needed to win. Uh, we went down to Miami and won. You want to hear a great story about that? A great sure. story <laughs> going down to Miami. It was at the end of the year. Didn't we win there the yeah, last March, game? And, March 6th, 58-53, you won. Yep. And uh, I go, you know how it is, you're coaching people and, you know, sometimes their parents can be difficult at times. And, you know, it, it's, it's, as I said, you know, it's tough. And I go, we go down to play at Miami and Frank Young's mother is like waiting when we come to the game or to the practice site, she's waiting where the bus comes up. And I said, Oh my God, I'm in for it now, man. I'm going to get it from Frank Young's mother. Cause Frank hadn't been playing much that first year. And as we walk off the bus, she like comes up to me and hugs me and thanks me for doing such a great job with her, her with her um, son. And then she also tells me that pa my son Patrick's one of her favorite players. How about that? Right? So I go into the locker room. I says, I don't care what the score is tonight. Frank Young is playing tonight <laughs> in this game. <laughs> and he goes in and hits a jump shot. I don't know if you can get that. I think he hit a jump shot. No, you're right. And he played well, and then he played well against Kent State in the NIT. Um, so it's it, those are incredible. That's We made the NIT, and I think, Tony, the first year was just make the Big East Tournament. Remember, we right. had been to the Big East Tournament. And then it was make the NIT, so the progression was happening. But that second year, I think, was hard. Uh, the, the second year, the just getting through it because expectations always make it harder. And yet you found a way, like you just said, you finished 17 and 14 back above 500. So again, while you felt the turmoil, I think externally people are looking at that saying, okay, here it goes. It's back on a well, good director, director here. I, I think we had to do, I remember Mickey, Mickey Fafara saying to me in the uh, first press conferences, how are you going to beat Connecticut and Syracuse? And I really say, I really don't care about beating them yet. I said, we just got to get to the middle of the Big East before we worry about getting to the top of the Big East. Yeah. And, and that's what we were trying to do. You had to go from, I don't know how many teams were in it then. If we had to go from ninth to eighth and then go from eighth to sixth, mm -hmm. those were good steps. And, and that's, uh, uh, that's what we did. That way we were very fortunate. In that, in that period, so probably that season, just here's a generalized statement that I think occasionally, not often, but occasionally that I would hear, you know, I, I like, I like it. You know, I love the guy. I love the love the kids. I just don't think this style will work in the big East. I just, I'm just worried that this, this passing screening, shooting, kind of, being shooting, great shooters. Like shooting, yeah. boy, I, rebounded. They, 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 they don't, they, they don't want to rebound it. And I just kind of remember that. And, and not that it's bad. I can understand, you know, where people were coming from. But what I think you did over a period of time was, obviously, you convinced people that you can be different. And to be quite honest, I've always thought that at West Virginia, you need to be unique and different in order to line up with a lot of the teams that you're playing because that uniqueness is your key. And I think that's what you did. I think that's what you did. You were unique. And different. I, I think it was, yeah, wherever, wherever we were, when you're rebuilding the program, it, it wasn't always, we had to be different. You just had to find a different way to win. Uh, Cause the, you know, as I said, there was a lot of, I was replacing coaches for whatever reason it didn't work and sometimes deserve, sometimes undeserved, but we, um, we had to be different. And, and I, we were on this, this uh, analytical it, compared to today, it was nothing, but about this point of spreading the floor, of of shooting threes, of playing a one-three-one defense, because 
uh, if people were isolating us man to man in a lot of areas, we weren't good. But if we if we were different, the one three one zone, which we we didn't play at all the last eight years I was at Michigan, was a godsend to us. The, I mean, Tyrone Sally and Mike Gansey and Deshaun Butler, oh my God, they were as good as anybody I've ever seen. Those three, uh, Tony Dobbins had been at Richmond was really good, but we had to be different offensively, defensively. Yes, we gave up. We gave up rebounds, but it's not like they keep the rebound. The rebounding determines who wins. It's a matter of possessions. So we went low turnovers on offense, high turnovers on defense with the one, three, one, right? Uh, when you have low turnovers on offense, you get a shot every time. So you can shoot more threes because and miss even have a bad night and you're still in good. So we were sort of on this analytic, not a kick, but an understanding necessity is the mother invention. We don't have another choice right now because we can't go toe to toe with Syracuse and Connecticut, who were tremendous at that it, it, at that time. We have to be different. When did you um, put your arms and, and wrap around the one three one? At what point in your coaching career did you kind of take a liking and think the one three one had a chance to be really good? When we were at Richmond, we um, it was funny. We were um, oh yeah, actually at Richmond, we were we were in our last year there we were not going to be allowed to play in the tournament. So we had a game at Wake Forest at Richmond that we had to win. We, I mean, it was actually at our place. We had to win it, it because we, I think we won 25 or 26 games. We still didn't get in the tournament. We had to beat somebody good. And I said, we got we to gotta trick them. We got to have something up our sleeve. So we threw it out against Wake Forest. They still beat us, but it was a great game. And we used it a couple more times. And then later on in the year, a uh, long story, but we, we used it again and helped us win a game. So then the next year, we joined the A-10. And I said, how are we going to be Temple and UMass? We can't. we got to be different. And, and we ended up going from the – to the cha- in our first year in the A-10, we went to the championship game, lost to Xavier, playing it on makes only, not on misses. And uh, – I think we played it pretty good. Maybe I'm not. I think we played pretty good against West Virginia the year before too. Huh. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, pretty, 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 pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. I, I, don't, good. Know. I don't know if, hell. We do, if we played one three one that year or not. But at any rate, we um, uh, it was so let's let's do it. It's going to be different. And at Michigan, it worked. I think one year we we had one good year with it, but the rest of it, we had to get rid of it because people were getting used to it. Yeah, and 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 we're getting plans, so we went all man to man. And uh, but that that was a savior for us as we as we grew these teams to be, you know, these cohesive units that play a particular style, much like Wisconsin does right now. I mean, they don't have all they haven't had a lot of NBA players, but they win like crazy because it's a style that the whole team plays and they really play together. They have a lot of fun. And I think actually fans love it. They love it when when they see teams that really play well together. Well, the one three one was the key, obviously, to West Virginia's success going to the Final Four. And Hugs freely admits, and you've probably heard it, that after you left, he would call Joe Mazzula and Deshaun together and say, "Okay, <laughs> seriously, this is true. I don't know if you've heard this, but he would say, all right, this one three one thing. Show me what the heck you guys were doing.' And then he go, and, and then he stop and practice. I go, okay." What okay? What Joe? What if the ball goes over there? What would you do then? And as you probably remember, you guys didn't know either. And sometimes you would change. Right? You would change oh, on yeah. the fly. No, we three, you changed. Yeah, we had three. We had three different ways we played it. As it, as it got as people got ways. I remember one year we were playing. We were playing a team, and and we were. Um, they, it was tied at half, and we said, "Let's move the slides back six feet," and we and we outscored them by twenty five in the second half. It was just it was a, just a hunch, so we got three different ways that we played it. People really didn't know what the difference, but Tyrone Sally knew right. <laughs> what he was doing, and so did Mike. And you know, it, it, when Dior was in the middle, that's when it probably was at its best uh, defensively. But when Kevin was in the middle of the following year, Kevin and uh, Rob Summers were in the middle. Our offense was really good that year, so it carried us. The defense wasn't as good. It was good, but it wasn't. It wasn't at a level like it was when Dior was in the middle. When you have a second guy with 100 block shots in a year, that really makes you makes up for a lot of mistakes. 
All right, let's move into 05. Now let's have some fun. 24 and 11 that year. <laughs> and you talk about when the style works, how beautiful it was. When you guys had it going, be it backdoor cuts, be it making threes, it, that, that was about as fun a style as you could watch. And that started pretty early against LSU. You absolutely rout LSU down in Baton Rouge. And that was one of those, Tony, we still giggle all the time. John Brady's still not sure what Coach Beeline was running there. And that was the yeah. origin of it's a great day to be a Mountaineer, was it not? Yes. Was that first when you time, first, first said that? First time ever used at LSU that Saturday afternoon. Ran him out of the gym yeah. in route to winning 10 straight. You started that season 10-0, and 0, Coach. Start us at the 2005 season. Well, did that you also – uh, the way football play that day or not? Is that why you said that? No, Tony, you would have, you never no, had that. No, time. that was before that was uh, yeah. no football game that day for whatever reason. So that was probably, what was it? It was November. What it had to be a November 27, date. November 27. Probably so for the whatever, week after the yeah, pit game, or they something. were off yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Wherever you may be. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that was a, uh, I remember we had a tough situation because in the practice day before Nick Patel has, has suffered a serious concussion. That's right. And we were really concerned about him, spent the night in the hospital and, we were really concerned about him, but we came out of there. Oh my goodness. We we're just, uh, Patrick couldn't miss. Uh, Kevin was throwing backdoor passes to <laughs> Tyrone Sally and Mike Ganzi. And oh my goodness. They were, they, they were a big athletic team that wasn't used to guarding five shooters on the perimeter. And so we really, uh, we played as well as we can against them. And, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was good. It was a, quite a trip to get the Baton Rouge. I remember, we had some long trips, didn't we, at West Virginia? Yes. We didn't, charter, we didn't charter back in those days. Oh, thank goodness we <laughs> charter now because those were long trips. I and remember. We get, we'd get you... to the airport in Pittsburgh, and our, our, leg, our, our luggage would be like – uh, Bobby should tell those guys sometimes when, they're, when people are upset about a trip, hey, we used to go into Pittsburgh and wait an hour and a half because there's a baggage strike or something going yeah. on. And oh man, long days. No, you, great days. Well, you were so people don't know this, but you were the catalyst to eventually getting us to, to to charter because of those situations. When we went and played at UCLA, uh, Mike Garrison, who would become the president at WVU, was on the trip with us. And if you remember, we flew out like it was. It might have been like seven o'clock at night or eight o'clock at night out of out of Pittsburgh. And then we red yeah. eye. We remember we took the red eye back. Red eye back yeah. and stopped somewhere. Because and stopped somewhere, and I remember like Mike going like, "Oh my gosh, are you guys kidding me? Is this how it is?" And it was, and then till <laughs> you know until now. Um, and then it, we had to come back and play Marshall. Exactly right. right? You're exactly right. And so and, that and was, we lost. Yeah. And we and we lost. Yeah. You know, real, real, real quick side note that that UCLA trip out there. What what I will always remember, interestingly enough, is is not so much winning the game, which obviously was was great. Tony, I remember the two of us walking right across mid floor, mid court. You waved to Don McLean. Thanks for having us. We're good to see. We giggle. We're laughing. Walking out of Poly Pavilion with win. I remember sitting with Patrick at the airport. Your, your son Patrick at the airport, and I was stunned, flabbergasted at the trash talking he claims to have done to Jordan Farmar that day. We talked, Coach, we talked for a half an hour. I said, are you kidding me? You were running your mouth to Jordan Farmar? He goes, oh, yeah, I was telling him all day. He couldn't guard me. Couldn't stop me. <laughs> was, it, was Patrick a big trash talker, huh? No, see, that this is – I learned that this year. They used to say Mo Wagner at Michigan was a big trash talker. Mm -hmm. And then when I played against him with the Cavs against Washington, he was trash talking me during the game. And I, I always defended him. I said, they were right. I, they, they hide it from the coach. They hide it yeah. from the ref. They do that. But the interesting thing about this game was Mike Parsons and Eddie called me like in the summer before we go to UCLA. And, and we are already going. We're going to play Texas and Kentucky yeah. in Kansas City. We're got, we got LSU coming home. We got the normal Big East schedule. We got to go to St. St. Bonaventure, I think. In Rochester. Uh, we got a lot. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we got like a really hard schedule. I'm, there's another couple games that are tough in the schedule. And they said, hey, you, you, CBS wants you to go out to UCLA to play the Bruins. Would you do it? And I said, absolutely not. We're like loaded. <laughs> We're, we can't do this. And they said, hey, we haven't been on CBS in a long, long time. And I says, oh, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and that's that's how the decision was made. And then they came back the next year, we and we got them the next year too. So um, 
that was a but we had to come back and play Marshall. And I remember still a fan from Huntington area, big West Virginia fan, uh, said he'd rather lose every game than lose. To, <laughs> he'd rather lose every game if we could only beat Marshall. I told him, you got to go to rehab. Man. You got problems. <laughs> you got to go to problems. So I mean, think about and, that. Anyhow, we, we, I was just going to say, go two and zero against UCLA. You, you, that's pretty good. You don't get that every day. Yeah. Now we were really, and and they, they, I mean, they were coming off of Final Four teams, mm-hmm. and they were good. They were good, but we, everybody, just played so well in that particular game. Mike stealing that ball. I, I felt, you know, at the end of that game, it was going the other way, and I'm not going to tell you why, but Tony probably can tell you why. It seemed to be going the other way, and uh, we were. The ball wasn't bouncing our way as the polite way I'm going to stay and say. And all of a sudden, it, uh, we steal that ball, and uh, we made some big plays. So I, uh, we were fortunate. But I know it was a red eye home. It was a happy red eye home. Yeah. I know that. Yeah, that season to talk to under underscore your point about how tough that schedule was. You played ten teams that were rated. You mentioned that trip to Kansas City we made, and that was a wild thing. There's two really good teams. Yeah. Texas was two in the country. Kentucky was seven. Later that season, you would play number seven, Oklahoma, number three, Villanova. Oh, that's right. Washington was 18. Pitt was 14. <laughs> Georgetown was 15. Connecticut was one. Pitt was eight. Then Pitt was 15. And then Texas was nine. So that was that was 2006 finishing up at 22 and 11, but that was, that was that season. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was overloaded. Let me, I want to oh, j- no. jump back to 05 though. For uh, me. No, I want to jump back even farther. Okay, go ahead. I always, I'm going to, and again, like I said, when we started, we just jump around. This to me was a foundational point of your tenure at West Virginia. And that was going back to your concept of everyone's got to want to play together and with each other and I and I as you well know we don't we don't bash players we don't we never have don't do it but point of it is this the Drew Shafino situation that to me has always been a foundational piece of what happened to you at West Virginia in molding team and I wanted to get back to that can you walk me through there because that was as ballsy of a move that you could have made at that point. He was leading you in scoring and it didn't, it just wasn't meshy. Your, what are your memories of that? Well, well, I have, I have a lot of memories of that and I feel, feel really bad about it because he was a, he was a young man that we really wanted to have a successful career. And, uh, but it just wasn't working. It just wasn't working. And so I was just best for him and best for us. We had to think of both of them for, to go in a, in a different direction at a very difficult time. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there's things I could have done better during that time to make it work. But we did. There comes a time every year that every, yeah, not every year, but in many years, you, you have to make tough decisions. And I, feel, I really feel bad about it because, um, it, you know, it, it was the end of Drew's career at West Virginia at the same time. Um, you know, we survived it and we really made a, we made a, a good run certainly after that. But uh, I still feel bad about it because as a coach, you don't want that ever to happen. Yeah. You lose your leading score. I know that. I know. And I, and I trust me. And, and he's, not a ba- he's not a malicious kid. But for the betterment of the big picture, you made the move that was hard to make where the easy one would have been, eh, let's just, try to, let's just try to get together. But actually, that to me was always that took that team off. That's, that's what set that team to a different direction. Everyone assumed new roles. So mm-hmm. I, I thought that was, that was always a key. Well, I think we went. To, I remember we, us going to. Uh, I think we beat Georgetown the next day, yep. and then we went to Mar. And when, when we won, we Tyrone Sally made some big foul shots against Marshall to win that game uh, the year before. And so we beat Marshall with those first two years, and that was, uh, you know, those were those were big wins for us because we were still trying to figure things out. So, uh, you know, whatever whatever reasons, it all worked out after that. But I still feel bad that. You know, we, could, we couldn't um, make the strides we went with through, so we had to make them without them. All right, dig in here, because I want to talk postseason 05 here. I think this is one of the most fun <laughs> stretches in, in West Virginia basketball history. So let, let's settle in here for a little bit and start back 
in the Garden, the Big East Tournament, that run, it begins with that game against Boston College, and there's so many just layers to that, given what was going on with the conference realignment and Boston College leaving to go to the ACC, already having been announced, that whole arena chanting ACC at them and behind West Virginia. Frank Young with a great game in that. So start with the Boston College game, and then we'll progress on to that Villanova game in the Big East Tournament 05. Hey, Brad, we can't start with the Boston College game. We got to start where we are. I, I convince Eddie and Mike Parsons that we need to fly to New York City on, on charter, not because we, we need to win a game. We need to win one or two games. Right. Because uh, mm-hmm. we, are, we are on the bubble. We are, even after that great start, we're on the bubble. Lost to Seton we Hall. Up, Lost to Seton Hall. Remember, regular season finale. Right, 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 right. So I convinced them to spend the money to do this. We're in the air over Scranton, and an ice storm Mm -hmm. hits New York City, and we can't land in New York. And we can't even land anywhere because the planes, the icing system is down. And so we're like in limbo. We're like, I don't know where we're going to fly to to land. And the sky opens up over Scranton. And the the, the the pilot goes down through the clouds, and we land in Scranton. And now we have what should be a two hour trip to New York. And it's probably, we miss, it's probably five o'clock, six o'clock. We end up having a bus driver come and pick us up. And it takes us, we get to New York City at three or three, Tony, three or four in the morning. Yeah, I don't absolutely. know. It was, yep, absolutely. It, and, and we have to play Providence, who we have beaten twice that year, but we have to beat Providence in the first round. And uh, we do, and we do soundly. And then the next morning, we wake up, and Tyrone Sally can't get out of bed. Our MVP cannot get out of bed, and we got to beat BC because now it's it's a one eight game or something to really be in. And Frank Young hits like five or six threes, and and we get out big on him and have to hang out. Pitsnagel hit a three right in front of us that was a dagger. You know, you could you'll hear. Um, uh, the announcer say dagger. I think it was Rafferty probably, and uh, and then beat Villanova. Uh, and one of those nights, we came back to the hotel, and the team, several important members of the team, got stuck in the elevator for like three hours. <laughs> we had to call the fire department <laughs> to come and get them out. This was after the game, and they hadn't showered, and they stood in there together, locked in shoulder to shoulder for two or three hours while waiting for the fire company. And now we go beat Villanova when when uh, Patrick misses a shot, Mike gets the rebound and has to make two foul shots. Uh, we couldn't hold it together with Syracuse, but just four amazing days in, in New York City after the, the start of that. Again, we were literally on the bus going five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, people flying off the road in this ice storm that they had so um wouldn't have had it any other way tony right because we all got to go to carmine (laughs) carmine for for italian after every win absolutely it was uh, those are those are memories that i don't think any mountaineer fan uh will will uh, will forget it was because that hadn't happened that's the other part of that those were just in and of themselves great games and a lot of fun but historically what west virginia had not done that you're used to going up to the garden losing the noon game and you're back headed home before the tournament even starts that's that's the part of that not just the individual games the cumulative effect of being able to play for a big east title for the first time that was that was remarkable And the style of play that folks saw, I think, really for the first time. Because fans, college fans will follow it during the course of regular season. But as you well know, March makes people more people watch. And then you go to the Garden and people start watching this West Virginia team. And they see Kevin and they see Mike and they see that style of play. And as everyone says, it took over the tournament people just like hey i don't i don't have a dog in this fight but i love the way that west virginia team plays that's where i think it became started to become a national uh, uh brand well they were they were they were really an easy team to like i think that when you saw how hard they played and played as a team you know they, let's face it when you go to the big east tournament there's the the reason they sell out every game during those days was because it's it's that it's a great basketball city and they really appreciate good basketball. Mm-hmm. And so if you, if whoever we were playing was probably where they were, it, their fans were rooting for theirs, but the other 14,000 was You're rooting right. for West, West Virginia without question, because they liked, 
They, I mean, how can you not like Mike Ganzi and Pitsnoggle and these guys out there? J.D. Collins just just giving his all every minute, you know, and we, we're bringing guys. Darius Nichols coming in off the bench, and, and it was just a really a, – uh, it's just a, a great group to coach, really a good group, group to coach. The uh, the Mike Ganzi free throws against Villanova, one of my greatest sports – memories forever the way that as you know the lights are only on on the court at the garden the concourse is darkened and it's Villanova (laughs) and it's the semis and the foul is called by Pat Driscoll and everyone stands in the entire garden as Mike goes to the line and you whispered over to him I love you and I mean that is just uh, that's that was that was a movie happening right in front of our eyes that was that was as good as it gets I'm getting choked up. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's, as, that's as good as it gets. And then, but wait, but wait, there's more, and that's the next week to the NCAA <laughs> tournament. We go to the Wolstein Center at Cleveland State, and a good Creighton team, Dana Altman. Nate Funk. Nate Funk. Nate Funk. <laughs> yes, Nate Funk. Nate <laughs> Funk leading the way. That was, you know, that game doesn't get the pop and the talk that it probably deserves wow because the Wake Forest game happened after, yeah. but that was an amazing game as well. well when you think about the way, uh, you know, Pistow gets the rebound, throws it to Gansey, throws it oh, to Sally, mm-hmm. lays it in, mm-hmm. and, and all in like three seconds or something. Yep. And and they, we still had a survive of Nate Funk shot, but what a what a fabulous game. I, I Just a fabulous game by all of our guys. Um, but it does, you're right. And, and Creighton, you, you saw how Dana's teams were – before that and in the future. And, um, yeah, just a, I think when we win, we finally make the NCAA tournament. And here we got, get the bus ride up to Cleveland. And we're playing Creighton, who's a lot like us, actually. And uh, it, just to get the W, that was the ball just bounced our way. I mean, just bounced our way in the game. But that last play to win, it was like, I'm watching it. And I said, what the heck is happening here? All of a sudden, we're laying it in. Because yeah. you're just saying, okay, I hope he misses the shot. We go to over, you know, he goes to overtime. He misses a shot and we win because you're ready. When you, after a hard, no coach wants to go to overtime unless he's like been down the whole game. And now you, you're thinking, man, we, we're, we're in it now. I think I was really sick too. I think I got technical because I was taking some steroids and I, I pounded the table. <laughs> I, I had a sore, really sore throat. I couldn't talk. Um, Jeff Newbauer was calling. I'd whisper in Je- Jeff's. Uh, in the ear, I'd say what we wanted to run, and Jeff was yelling. And I hit the table one time, and I, I got a tentacle. It might have been the Wake Forest game. I don't know. But just the, magically, the way that ended was incredible. It was <laughs> – you and you and Canseco all roided out. Yeah, him and Jose Canseco just <laughs> we were juiced. All I juiced was all juiced up. Juiced up. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, man. among all the games that you've been involved with, Wake Four. Oh my gosh, I mean these games you've been involved with. I mean Final Fours and the whole thing. National championships. National championships yeah. games. So where's Wake? Where's Wake Four sit? Top ten, top five. Oh, top t- uh, top top five. Top, top five. five. Yeah. O- only because of the. And forget about Chris Paul, and he was tremendous in it. There was no question. He's, he was great in it. But it was double overtime. It was Mike's performance in his home city. Yep. It, it was every time we we get up by five, they'd make a three. They And then we get up by four, and they'd make a three. We just couldn't get away from them. They were so talented. And Skip, really a close friend, and, you know, the wheeling guy and the whole thing, you know. So – um, that was a that was a great one for us. I still remember. Just a West Virginia seemed to we took over that arena too. By the mm-hmm, way, mm-hmm. I, there was no question. Yeah, it was great. I still remember the Let's Go Mountaineer going from side to side, and I don't hear the crowd much. I heard it that night. Yeah, I heard it that night. I heard it in Charleston for the first time uh, when we beat uh, Florida. Uh, in the first year, and I heard it that night loud. It was it was great. So proud to to be a Mountaineer and to coach that team and be affiliated with that university uh, that weekend. So balance in that game was amazing. You had seven players, seven players that scored eight or more points in that game. And <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the five spot in that game in which Kevin and Dior shared um, because they had the big horse Eric Williams who 
I've always felt, I mean, he was just unstoppable in the first half. Either they didn't go to him or Dior's presence impacted him. What's your take and memory on that matchup second yeah. half? I told you I've been talking to Dior, and Dior said to me, you know, I was so mad at you going into that game because if you look at the um, the game against uh, uh, Creighton, Dior didn't play a lot because Kevin was playing really well. And uh, Dior didn't play a lot in that game. So he was like really mad at me. And Coach Neubauer, you know, you're always managing personalities. Now we're laughing at it 15 years later. And he just went in and, you know, he threw the big pass to Sally. But William's definitely thinking about him. Dior had this nice little 15-foot jumper that he hit. Uh, And then Mike Ganzi in overtime, in the two overtimes, was, was incredible. It was so good. So... But, but uh, yeah, I think that Dior had a huge impact on that one. And, you know, it, bringing Eric Williams away from the basket, because Skip just played man-to-man. So when Kevin was in there, we, we, we could extend them a little bit and, and make the court bigger. 23 and 14 combined for Dior and Kevin in that one. Yeah. <laughs> 23 points for You'll yeah. take that, right? You'll take that out of the yeah, five. Yeah, the five and, it was, and it was, when you think about it, in, a, in a, what, a 50-minute game, uh, they were key because Kevin Kevin couldn't play like that. What did Kevin play? Probably thirty, and Dior probably played twenty or something. So it was uh, they, they couldn't have played fifty minutes the way the you know big men big men are are getting you know jostled around in the post, then got to sprint the floor. They had the longest for hard for them to play that many minutes. So that's those two were great. They complemented each other yeah. so well that, that season. Well, and then you, and, and you talk about the complementary players, and you had that a little bit in J.D. at the point, who had, who had 12 and 6 in that game. J.D. got you 12 points, which he wasn't known for a score. You have Darius Nichols, a young Darius Nichols, that has that huge block against the backboard there when he pinned oh, it. Yeah, so yeah. it wasn't just the five. It was the one giving you a combination of yeah. guys, too. No. And, and don't forget in that season now, that was the one that was – a little bit of a Wally Pip moment when uh, when Dior was sick for the Pit game at mm-hmm. home, and Kevin got Kevin had to start. Kevin wasn't starting, and we start him, and he I don't know he got eighteen points. He hit threes all over the place, and then Dior started. They changed places, and yeah. while we were good before, we we really were good afterwards. And it takes a heck of a teammate to to help us like that. Dior came through even though he lost his job when Kevin just. Kevin played so well in the month of February and March. It was that game, and and I always remember one specific play across from you uh, toward where the fans sit, across the same side where you were sitting, standing. There was a scramble for a loose ball. There were about four or five players down. The ball squirts up, and Kevin gets the ball and dunks it. And as you well know, he he wasn't a big dunker. (laughs) But But the roof almost came yeah. off of the Coliseum at that point. And I always look at that moment as that was a key play in that game. I and so. I think a key play in that season, that kind of said, okay, off we go. And uh, and, and that was a huge part oh, of it. Yeah, and Pitt was, Pitt was at that time a, a top 10 team all the time. And I, I still remember, and I'll admit it now, that it was like I went to the locker room and people – it's a shame that Pitt and West Virginia don't play anymore. It's it's or if they do play, it's not as frequently. I, I remember saying, "God, thank goodness I got that Pitt thing off my back for a while," you know. <laughs> yeah. Because then we went. Remember, we went up and beat them later on yeah, too that yeah, same year. Yeah. yeah and, yeah. and and Kevin was Kevin Kevin was incredible uh, in that game too. So um, the uh, that we wanted to get that we hadn't beaten Pitt in a while. Because they were so well coached and such a good team, and their their program was ahead of ours. It really was ahead of ours, and we caught them that that year, and then we ended up, uh, you know, being able to uh, have that great se- postseason because of it. Yeah, that was you're talking about. It was February February 23 at the peak. West Virginia was getting beat convincingly. And if again, that's a pit snoggle play. He hits, he hits what yeah. I always call about a twenty-two foot jump hook off the right You're exactly side. Exactly right, and it, and it's it was st- just inside the three-point line. It felt like it's yeah. probably right at the elbow is where it was, but it was a jump hook from an, an area where you don't take a jump hook. Exactly, and then that started that thing, and you and you rallied and you won that game. So Cleveland is unbelievable. Wake Forest, and then you match up with Bobby Knight and Texas Tech, and that was also. Uh, 
just a great, great moment. 65-60, you win that game. And a basketball-starved West Virginia program, West Virginia as a state, man, that was fun. People were high-stepping, and off you go now, and you're in the Elite Eight. Yeah, we 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 got to go to Albuquerque, you know, and it's so loud and what a what a great play. And then you get to coach against Coach Knight, and uh, who is I've always admired so much as a coach, and he he couldn't have been more complimentary uh, to our team. And you know, I think we played a lot like some of those Indiana teams that he that he coached, a lot of teammates and great teammates. And so yeah, we hung on that one. That one we had to make foul shots at the end. Uh, uh, during the game, and we had to get the ball in balance, and we uh, it was a fabulous win for everybody, and 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 put us so close to, you know, yeah, I think it was all such a surprise to us at the time as well, that we were we were, okay, this has got to be it, you know, this has got to be it. We we couldn't live this dream any better, and then we just kept winning. All right. And uh, I wish now I look back at it. And, uh, you know, I, I, when I told myself when we got in a run in any other NCAA year, it would be, no, it's not it yet. I kept convincing myself it's not it because that, uh, that could even, we could have went to, to, we could have won a national championship as hot as we were during that year, but, uh, it didn't work out that way. Yeah. So if Wake Forest is in your top five all time of the great ones, I'm imagining the Louisville game after that is top five most painful. Yeah. Yeah, it was, and, and it's sort of we did it to ourselves because the pain was was actually good stuff that we end up getting up so big. I mean, you can't get up eighteen yeah. on a Louisville team with like thirty minutes to go and say, "Oh, this is gonna we, we got them now." They're they're gradually. I think it was thirteen at half, and then it was it just kept going down and down and down. They're eventually gonna catch you. We needed the game to be about thirty eight minutes mm-hmm. long. And mm-hmm. we got a W. And it's so funny because it came down to, uh, I think, an offensive rebound they got mm-hmm. after a tough shot. And and Joe Airbear had played so well. And, and he uh, the guy fell down guarding him. And Joe was like 15 feet from the basket, didn't go in. And then we had the last shot. And, and we didn't make the play. And we didn't make the shot. And we don't win. But uh, it was still, you know, it, it was such a, like I said, such a storybook season that it was uh, every bit of it was worth it. And uh, we we did our best. That's all we can say. We did our best, and that team did their best. Our coaching staff and every one of those walk-ons, every one of those bench players, everybody that was on that team contributed to an incredible year. It, it makes it harder to lose. the. You know, it's interesting as you look back on that now because you just have a different perspective. You went on and, and made Final Fours after that. West Virginia ultimately got to a Final Four. It felt like at the time, I'll just speak personally, because I've, I've said this before, Coach, I've been physically ill at two Mountaineer sporting <laughs> events in my time there. That was one of them. The After that game, physically ill getting off the bus after that, because my yeah. thought, I, I would assume it would mirror yours. The tournament is so tricky, and it's so hard to win, and you can have great yeah. teams and not get that far. The, the thought of, oh, my God, we're one rebound or we're one basket away from yeah. this. Will it ever happen again? Did that cross your mind at that time? Yeah, I, you know, I always thought that, uh, you know, a Sweet 16, if we were to get to those Sweet 16s, anything can happen. But the Final Four was was not in that five-year plan, I don't think, <laughs> when we first got there, right. let alone a three-year plan. So uh, I think when after I look back at it, we were very fortunate to get to that point. You know, the Creighton game could have – but when you think of all those games – how they went to the last minute, starting all the way with Boston College, Villanova. Okay, forget the series. The game was closer than you'd think. Then Creighton, then Wake, yeah. then Texas Tech. Yeah. You know, it, it's tough to keep blowing up that balloon and say it's not going to break pretty soon. So I, I, I do have that realization that we could have been out earlier uh, with, and, and still had a great team. So, uh, but it did, it did make us all very very sick but i think that everybody looked back on it and say you know what we did our best especially because we didn't have this in all year long just fabulous team that couldn't get beat we had some ups and downs and we had to correct ourselves big win at providence that year and when, when things were 
were not going well. We lost a lot of home games, Notre Dame, BC, after we got off that 10-0 and start, and we were ranked. How about the game at Villanova? Where we lost a hundred and one to nothing. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah oh, I remember that. Well, yeah. Oh, the lar- I mean, the largest loss by a ranked team to an unranked team in the history of college basketball. Uh, it just set us. It set us off. But the team kept fighting back. Yeah. Well, you also got the sweetest revenge of all that same season, as we just talked about that Nova game in the Garden. So. If you can, what was your rec- what was your thought then after having that run into the next season? We've talked about the 06 season, yeah. how difficult it's going. So what was your expectation? What should have been your expectation yeah. after that? Well, I, I, we were – Dior was graduating. Tyrone was graduating. And so there was a big – you know, that we knew we were going to lose two really good players. But the expectations were sky high. Kevin, Kevin Pistnido, you know, flirted with the pros for a little bit and came back. Uh, we were just trying to plug in, okay, what do we have to do? But like I said, we were, there was an aggressive schedule coming at us. LSU was coming back. Uh, we had uh, some, some big games in front of us. And um, I, I'm, I'm be- I think I'm better preparing for the season as an underdog than when there's expectations. Yeah. Because we looked into that schedule and, you know, the Texas and the, the Texas and the, and the Kentucky, yeah, Texas and the Kentuckys and LSU coming back, mm-hmm. man, it was that was that was going to be a tough, tough year, and uh, we we weathered through it. When we got to Oklahoma and we got that win at Oklahoma, which I that was another one. They were like I don't know what they were. They were top ten, weren't seven. they? Seven. They were they, seven. They were they were seven, and we're going to their place. I remember I didn't want to leave my hotel room. I said <laughs> I just want to stay here. This is going to get ugly, and the next thing you know, we're celebrating. Because we had already lost it. You know, remember JD, we were bringing the ball up the floor. The ball bounced off his foot when he was trying to call timeout against LSU's trap. And then they hit a three, yep. like from the stands. Yeah. And we lose. And it was, oh, man, those were tough. But it was all worth it. We just kept go grinding away. And the kids had, had great wins that year. Terrific ones. Uh, great one at Villanova, if you remember. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Jumping all the way down then, uh, the Texas game in the NCAA tournament. We get a nice break when we go to, to Detroit with Northwestern State upsetting. They beat Iowa. Beat Iowa. Uh, and yep. so you get Northwestern State, take care of there. You go to Atlanta, the Texas game. Kevin hits the shot to tie it at 71. That was such a gut-wrenching moment because that was like, here's the Beatles. Right, everyone loves the Beatles. The Beatles are in concert. <laughs> Beatles are in concert, and the Beatles all of a sudden they're playing their last song, and someone pulls the plug on the power and goes like, "Beatles are gone, done. Uh, See you but later." Isn't it the best and worst part of that tournament? The best was hitting the shot, and you and you might live to dance another day, and then five seconds later, yeah. the game's over. You're out of the tournament, and that senior class coach done. We won't see them again. Misery. Uh-huh. And LSU beat and LSU beats yeah. Duke, yeah. Yep. and we would have not lost LSU twice. That wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And, and yeah, so no, it was too bad. I didn't even know what to think. The locker room was. Remember Dave Hardesty, who was a great president for me. He just, oh man, he was always there for us when we, when we needed him. And he uh, he's in the locker room with. I, we didn't. Nobody knew what to say. Right. It was just okay. How did that? How did that? How was this so good? But why does it have to end that way? It was mm-hmm. an incredible combination of those two things. So, uh, and that was those five. That, that senior night, too, that year, when we played Pitt at our place, and yep. Joe stole the ball, or we inbounded it, nobody guarded him, and Joe went and laid it in. We were, up by, we were up by like two, and we had an inbound, and Joe all of a sudden is laying it in. And that senior, that was the loudest I ever heard the Coliseum. Yeah. It was a, I had never heard it as loud as that. And like I said, I don't listen a lot, but it was maybe because I was at half court when they, every the five seniors came out. Yeah. And just a, a just a fabulous time in, 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 I know, my life, and I hope it is West Virginia history that, that particular year. Yeah, and as you said, so you had five seniors, which you almost never can find nowadays, right? Because just the way that the game is and kids yeah. leaving yeah. early and da 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 yeah. da but to have five and those five that played that many games, that played that many games and <laughs> took the thing from where it was to where uh-huh. it is, that was 
as as memorable of a moment as I think that you'll see. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that those uh, as I said, I, I I hope to write a book soon, and I think there's a there's a chapter in each one of those seasons right there because of the small things that made that team great, the sacrifice, the dedication, the support from the university. Uh, there was a lot of great things that happened uh, during that time. And, and uh, it really set up a culture that as, as you go into the, my last season at, at West Virginia, that was already there. Darius Nichols and Alex Ruoff and Joe Alexander, these guys that had cameo performances in many of those games, they like, oh, no, this is the way we do it. And they were, all of a sudden, Deshaun and Wellington and Joe are walking into that. This is how we do it at West Virginia. So, they, But it, it, when you say that's how you do it and you actually won because of it, great credence for the next teams. Right. And, uh, and I think it's, I, 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 it carried on. And it, when, when Bobby got the team as well and they've never stopped, it's great. I'm very proud of that, that, that uh, just the, the building of this to have the, you know, West Virginia is going to be in the b- college basketball picture forever now. And we're not, nobody's going to be forgetting about it. And that's really the way it's been um, since those years. Perception to me on the West Virginia football and basketball job is this from a coaching perspective. Um, really good job, really hard job. Really good because winning tradition, um, top 20 all-time in wins, football, basketball. Um, people really, really care, great passion. However... Because you don't have your in-state um, kids just floating around that you know you're going to get two or a couple, two, mm-hmm. three every year. Is that a fair assessment on what the West Virginia job is in your view? Yeah, I think that once you realize, I wouldn't say hard is the right word. I think that once you realize who you are and that just you don't, you just for whatever reasons, that, you, that there's not a tremendous amount of talent in, within the state. That's just going to, you don't have to recruit them there. Everybody's, you know, dreaming of going to West Virginia and they go there and they're, they're great. You, you have to just, um, you know, make changes and make sure that you're still getting the best talent because the team, the, the state deserves the winning teams and they've, they've had, it. it's great tradition, but the job is, is just different in that respect where if you're in Ohio, or you're in Michigan, you know, you're at Syracuse and you get the best New York players and there's four or five to choose from. You might, in Michigan, we might fight with Michigan State for a guy or two. At, that, at West Virginia, it doesn't really happen uh, because there's just not four or five guys. But when they're there, it's always good to get them. And um, we were – Kevin Pitsnagel made us a really good team, and we're fortunate to have them. Yeah. All right, so you're going to write this book. So somewhere in the book, you're going to write about <laughs> – so somewhere in the book – I just this is called what we call the pre-release, you know, kind of a trailer, <laughs> trial of a yeah. trailer. So, so you're going to do the pre-release at some point. So at some point in the book, you're going to go, okay, and then I had my fifth season at West Virginia, and I decided to move on. When you look back at that, why did it make sense at that time? Oh, I don't know. It didn't make sense at any other time that before that, prior to that. You know, we were having a lot of success, and so there was there were some other opportunities that we just said no to. We just like, no, we're, we're not finished here yet. We don't have this thing. Um, going in the direction where it's going to, it's going to stay solid. We, we got to keep going. And, but there was a special uh, time there, but Michigan also gave us a special opportunity. So it was, it wasn't like one or two years or something like that it was five really good growing years. And we felt the program was in, was in tremendous shape. Uh, we, uh, that's sort of where it came to. And I think that's exactly what I said. This is not about leaving West Virginia. This is about, have an opportunity to go to a school like Michigan, which is another great school. So uh, it all worked out both ways, and it worked out for West Virginia as well because they got a tremendous coach in, when, when Bob came. So um, never easy to leave anywhere, and there's never a good time to leave anywhere, any, t- any place. But it was uh, we cherished our time at West Virginia, that's for sure. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, was it stunning? No, five at Richmond, five at Canisius, or five at Canisius, five at Richmond, five at West Virginia, then on to Michigan. So now, the question is: Now you're going to be a book author, or you're going to he's going to mess around with the meat. He's going to jump over to this <laughs> side this coming basketball season. Oh, if, if, right. we, if we play games, you're going to do a little Big Ten Network stuff. So, sixty-seven is that correct? Is that how old you are? 
67. Yes, 67. Sir. Young 67, Brad. I think you can call it. Yeah, yes. Senator, Very young 67. So, thank, so, thank you. <laughs> do you know yet? Do you know yet if the itch will prevail and you walk back out there with a team, or do you think it might not? Do you know yet? No, no, I don't know yet. I think what will really be good because if I am going to do the uh, uh, the media this year, I'm I'm really looking forward to getting into gyms again, watching teams practice. Getting I want to be I want to be good at this. And I think once I'm in those gyms again, and I start seeing the young men being coached and watching live games and practices, I'll know. I think it will be very obvious to me by next February or March whether I want to do one more shot. I mean, I think I can do effectively do anything right now uh, up until, you know, into my 70s. I, I don't have any worries about that, but I have to have that itch. I got to have that same passion yeah. that I had, and, and, but, and I have to be health, feel healthy too. And I do right now. I really do. But um, this is, a, it, whatever it is, been an incredible journey, and I've been blessed, really been blessed to, to, to just get this far. Did, and, uh, it, yeah, and I I totally get it. I totally get it. Here's 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 my uns, here's my, here's some unsolicited thoughts. Unsolicited <laughs> thoughts. Oh, this will be good. Okay, coach, get ready here. Here's this will be, this will be good. Here's some, here's some unsolicited thoughts. This will be good. Like coaches, coach, right? Musicians, musicians play music. Coaches, coach. Writers, write. <laughs> and and I think you're still at the absolute. Like you figured it out. You got it down. So you got to do it again. That's my thought. Like you gotta go, you gotta do it again. It's kind of like the Godfather. Just when I thought they were on, they brought me back in again. You gotta, you gotta still do it, man. You, you were, you had the thing. Like you, you did the hard work. Now you know how to do the thing. You got to do it one more time. You got to go one more. I'm just saying, will, Senator. What I, do you I think? Guess. I would like yeah. to see him do one more, but it's not our decision. How, okay, how about this? Have you enjoyed the time away? Has that been good for you? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think so, and like I said, I wish I, I wish uh, I would have been more successful in the NBA. But at the same time, I real, also realized it wasn't it, as I said to many, it wasn't healthy for me. Uh, and that now that I sort of got a different perspective, I'm ready to dive back into something really strong. Uh, but I just need this time to be away right now, so that I can be sure going forward. Yeah. I just I just I want to be sure of it. I don't do not want to be in a situation again. Where you know you go in and all of a sudden you say, "No, this isn't. This doesn't feel right." Uh, I want to be. We, uh, we're paid way too much as coaches, so I want to uh, make sure that we're. It's right. So, yeah. you guys, they didn't tell me about the hard balls that we're going to be on this. Well, this you know, show. that's what, <laughs> well, here's my here's my last here's my last thing. Like when McCartney was done with the Beatles, he still wrote songs. <laughs> he he did Wings, right, Brad? I mean, he went and did Paul McCartney and Wings. He's very so. You still have to be able to go like, no, I got one more left. In. Now let me just tell you this. This is pretty wild, and we talk about this. Hugs eventually will get into the Hall of Fame. You're a Hall of Fame guy. Think about that, Coach, that you, West Virginia will have back-to-back Hall of Fame coaches. That's that's hard to do. That's hard to well, do. Well, I'm not in any Hall of Fame. You're you talk a guy. No, 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 don't start, Stop don't start that. Aren't you, in the Burt, aren't you in the Burt New York Hall of I'm Fame? <laughs> Oh, oh my God! If oh, people man. knew, let me just give an example. So, c- coaches from Burt, New York. So, Burt, New York, would be smaller than Blacksville, West Virginia. That's how small Burt, New York is. It's just they're, they're, a teeny they're, new they're, fame. We used to have a post office. We don't even have a pers- post office anymore. That yeah, was it's it. a, yeah, it's a it's a cr- it's a cross it's a crossroads. I think there's one tavern there. Of course, there is in every place in New York in in Niagara County. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. But uh, that's it. That that's it. You know, a real, very small place. But uh, yeah. But I I don't know if I'm in that Hall of Fame either, though, Tony. But no, maybe we'll work at that and, one. No, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, well, you're being. You don't any, have to say it. We'll, we'll say it. Take, you're we'll, in. We'll, yeah, we'll, you're we'll in. take care of it. All right. Well, listen, man. I can't thank you enough uh, for your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed it because, yeah. as I said at the start, we've never really had the opportunity to kind of get your perspective and take on the whole five-year build because it was we we talk again like we talk about it like it happened three weeks ago we just refer to it as if and now we're getting old and people are going like wait a second i wasn't even born then but that's that's what we do yeah it feels to us as if it just happened a few weeks ago yeah well that that six seven season was really rewarding as well that was with, with 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 watching the assimilation and 
the improvement of Alex Ruoff and Joe Mazzulla. And yeah. Darius was very good. Jimmy, Jamie Smalligan making big shots. And Frank, yeah. oh, my goodness. Frank, Frank made 100 threes that year, guys. So go back to your West Virginia look and see how many times guys made 100 threes in a year. He had made 119, I think. Yeah. And so that's that, and that I mean, stretch coach that those last four or five games that 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 Frank was on we had him on this podcast a few weeks ago and talked about that stretch in particular he was unconscious <laughs> during that run he was nuts yeah no I mean we went and and that Louisville Louisville beats us in that that game in the uh, Gardner we would have been in the NCAA tournament that mm-hmm. that was for sure mm-hmm. but we win the NIT I mean I think it was better for us we won the NIT that was four or five more games that that these guys just had to get better. And uh, and then, as I said, Bobby knew what to do with him when it comes to uh, that team after that. Yeah. Hey, we have to ask Coach this because we say this, and I know we got to let him go. But we, Coach Tony, and I talk about this a lot. The NIT doesn't get the respect sometimes it deserves because it gets so overshadowed. We contend that run, the Delaware State, the the UMass, the UMass game UMass, at the Coliseum, yeah, one of the yeah. all time great games. I don't care what tournament it was in. Going back to the Garden for a second time, laying it on Mississippi State with Darius's shot, and then winning against Clemson. That was as fun a run, and being in New York <laughs> in the spring, that was his, it wasn't quite a Final Four yeah. run. We had a blast that in the fun. NIT. That, that was great. That was that, fun. No, that was, uh, that was a great team to, to coach. They were all in in every aspect, and we just, the coaching staff, and I mean, we enjoyed every minute of it. They were, they were good. If they were an NCAA tournament team, if they would have got selected, they probably would have been a Sweet 16 team. Yeah. Uh, I always thought that whoever wins the NIT, you know, probably was a Sweet 16 team at least in the NCA. But that was a tough year to get in, and we didn't make it. And uh, we, uh, it, we, we, there wasn't just a Louisville game. There's one more game we need need to win. But it, if it led West Virginia to get to the Final Four years later, then it was all worth it. That was one of the good uh, undercover trash talking too. Frank Young told us that that UMass game. We we knew he was getting trash talked because that was obvious. Yeah. Frank said he was giving it right back, and he may have even started it, which also stunned us. Yeah, quiet assassin uh, yeah. Frank yeah. Young there. Giving quiet assassin, talk. Like the silent uh, assassins. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Joey Alexander and Alex and those guys were really good in those games too. Goodness, yeah. yeah. They really, really. Darius was Darius was tremendous. So. Okay, guys. Hey, listen, we're going to, just to let you know, uh, we will be your uh, grassroots organizers back here in West Virginia for your return to coaching. It'll be the senator and I. We'll be pushing <laughs> that campaign forward, and uh, we, we look forward to the next stop. All right. Well, thanks you very, very much. All right, brother. And Take thanks care. Thanks for having me on the show, and hello to all of our friends in West Virginia. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, John. Take right, care. Bye now. There he is, John Beeline, three guys before the game. Wow. Huh? That was good. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Like I said, uh, here, here's just, the, another amazing thing. Like, great to hear from him because we just haven't been able to catch up since he's been gone. How about the recall he just gave you? Now, that's yeah. a long time ago. He's played in a lot of games, <laughs> coached in a lot of games since leaving here. He had some tremendous recall. I know. That was fun. That was good stuff. Hope you all enjoyed that. And uh, that was really good. Share it. Let people know it's out there. And three guys before the game, we'll be back next week with this reminder that our program is brought to you by Burdett Camping Center, the only warranty forever RV dealer in all of West Virginia. Visit them at burdettcamping.com. They're located in Winfield, and you name it, they've got it when it comes to recreational vehicles. By the way, did you see, and I told you this earlier, the RV business is going off the rails as far as sales go because of COVID-19. People saying staying in clothes, staying together, getting the RV. And off you go. Check them out at BurdetteCamping.com. We'll be back again next week. Stay well for our producer, Daniel Woods, the senator. We're out. Three guys before the game. See y'all. See y'all.